Good afternoon, everyone. This is Larry Stevens with the Spring Stewardship Institute in Flagstaff, Arizona. And we're holding a webinar today on springs and springs dependent species of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is a Bureau of Reclamation funded project uh, sponsored here by the Museum of Northern Arizona and the Spring Stewardship Institute. We'll take a, our time a little bit as, as uh, uh, other people are signing on with the call here, but just to uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, Jerry Ledbetter, our, our management uh, information management specialist is online as well. Monica Sweetheart is the information management technician and Jen Chavez is assisting with uh, with the production as well today. Just to let you know that um, uh, you are not muted so you can ask questions but if you have background noise um, please please Okay, I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, so again, once again, you are not muted. So you can ask questions uh, uh, at will, but please mute yourselves if there's a lot of background noise. This session is being recorded, and we will post uh, the PowerPoint that we're talking our way through here on our website as we have in the past. The entire uh, sound system will, will also be recorded for that. So we hope everybody here can, can, can hear and see the screen. And, uh, but please raise your hand at any time using the, the box on the right, right side of your screen there uh, to ask a question. Or you can also type in a question at any time to the control panel and uh, one of us uh, will, will uh, try to answer that, that question at the end of this slide. Once again, this is the, uh, the Spring Stewardship Institute's third webinar on Springs of the Desert Landscape Co Conservation Cooperative. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, an effort to map the springs of the, of the desert southwest and document the, the uh, springs dependent species that live in those springs, as well as conduct outreach to uh, spring stewards throughout the landscape and to, to uh, uh, provide some climate risk modeling, uh, uh, which is to be talked about in, in a subsequent webinar. All right, so we'll start the, start the PowerPoint here. Um, um, yep, very good. So the Spring Stewardship Institute is an initiative of the Museum of Northern Arizona. We're a nonprofit private museum here in Flagstaff, established uh, in 1934. And our, the Spring Stewardship Institute, which we just began two years ago here, is an effort to improve the understanding of springs ecology and conservation, uh, stewardship uh, more than conservation, actually. Uh, our effort uh, is to educate the public and resource managers about the importance of springs and the benefits of caring for springs. We partner with many other organizations, agencies, tribes, and researchers to help improve the management of these critically endangered ecosystems. With the Desert uh, Landscape Conservation Cooperative Project, this is a 2014-2015 uh, funded project by the Bureau of Reclamation. This consists of four tasks. The first is the daunting task of getting a better map of the distribution of springs in the, in the desert southwest uh, within the United States. The, the DLCC landscape extends well into Mexico. I understand the Fish and Wildlife Service is, is trying to figure out how to uh, better coordinate uh, efforts for uh, resource management in that portion of the landscape with Mexico. But for our project, we're just focused on the U.S. portion of the DLCC. So the effort is to, to compile information on springs in that landscape, uh, to make that information available to land managers through a secure online set of uh, internet related resources. And um, uh, we've had two webinars about uh, t discussing those topics before. And if you're interested in, in that information, you can step back to those, uh, to those webinars on our website. Website is springstewardship.org and the information is all there. The, so the first task is this issue of mapping springs. Springs are very poorly mapped. Every time we go out on, a, on an inventory, we find um, typically an equal number of springs that haven't been mapped as well as the ones that uh, were out, sent out to inventory. The second task is uh, 
uh, uh, even a little more daunting, which is to, de to determine the biological diversity and distribution of springs-dependent species of plants, macroinvertebrates, and vertebrates at springs. There are, you know, uh, several dozen endangered species that live at s that are that are springs-dependent within the Southwest, but there are thousands of, uh, of species that are either unique to springs or are rare species occurring only at springs in the landscape that are, have not been documented. So we're trying to pull that information together and that's really the focus of today's talk. The third task uh, is to conduct outreach through webinars such as this, through workshops that we're, we're offering and we have a, a workshop scheduled for Las Vegas in mid-October. We'll talk about that towards the end of this presentation. We also provide courses, more detailed courses. Uh, the website is uh, is growing daily and uh, and uh, providing more tools on inventory assessment and in, uh, and collaborative information sharing where that's desired. And uh, and the security of that that system is is now very very robust. So that all that uh, allows for better communication about springs across landscape boundaries, which is often an issue because the aquifers don't know the don't know the human uh, political boundaries, and springs are often uh, fed by aquifers that, that, uh, uh, from, uh, from far away places. The fourth task is to develop a climate change risk model uh, for the U.S. portion of the DLCC, and this will be ba based largely on the mapping that we're doing in task one, the termination of springs dependent species distribution in task two, and then doing uh, some GIS relationship between the hydrologic uh, 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 subunit, uh, base and subunits, as well as human population demands. So that, that'll be the last uh, task of the project. At any time, please feel free to ask questions. Again, you can write them in the box, or uh, if you're uh, unmuted there, just go ahead and, and, uh, and ask. So today's agenda is to look at uh, the, uh, the, to introduce this process, which, which we've just done a bit, to talk about uh, uh, the DLCC project task two, springs dependent species and talk about the purpose, uh, the development of draft species lists, uh, talk about the, uh, uh, our engagement of experts to vet those lists, talk about ranking criteria so the manager can understand rather quickly what are the springs dependent species, how dependent they are on springs, and, and um, what their conservation status is, then how this fits into the uh, spring stewardship database, uh, talk about our progress to date. This is an on, ongoing effort. And then the next steps relating tasks one and two to the climate risk model, which will be a, a, the subject of a future webinar. Lastly, we'll talk about the uh, upcoming plans for, the, for the, uh, uh, the workshop to be held in Las Vegas in October. Okay. To refresh our memory, springs are places where groundwater reaches and usually flows from the Earth's surface. These are ecosystems with strong subsurface to surface linkage, and therefore they're often called groundwater dependent ecosystems. But unlike other GVEs, such as caves, streams, lakes, oceans, uh, the springs are uh, are, are ecosystems that are very strongly linked to the surface, and that's what gives them their unique characteristics. We have, we're working with our, our colleague Abe Springer over at NAU, we've identified 12 terrestrial forms of springs as well as paleo springs, each of which uh, supports micro, many, many microhabitats and mosaics of species that, uh, that co-occur, maybe they interact or not, but uh, these are uh, very complicated ecosystems, some of them very tiny, some of them reaching uh, more than a hectare in size uh, here in the southwest. Uh, so it's a, it's a really wonderful arena to, to uh, be able to uh, get a better understanding of ecosystem ecology, which was actually founded at Silver Springs in Florida, but uh, really hasn't been pursued much since then, as well as develop better stewardship uh, understanding of, of, uh, of the needs and, and uh, management options for springs. Springs support remarkably high biodiversity of, of rare and unique species throughout the, throughout the desert southwest, actually everywhere on earth. It's just that there are these, these uh, uh, ecological gradients are so sharp in the, in the desert southwest that everybody can see that springs are hot spots in the landscape for, for biology and biota. The DLCC landscape, uh, as we've said before, is, is uh, uh, configuration of lands, it actually extends well into Mexico, but here in the, so in the desert southwest, it stretches from, from Death Valley in southeastern California uh, diagonally down to southwestern Texas. 
includes the southern half of Arizona, southern half of New Mexico, a uh, small portion, very small portion of Utah, and uh, uh, southern portion of Nevada. So it's uh, several several states, many land land jurisdictions within that, and as you can see from this map of the springs of that region that Jerry Ledbetter's put together. It's quite a large array of springs. I think we're looking at about 15,000 species, uh, 15,000 springs within the landscape so far. We hope that is uh, more than one in five, but because of the mapping issues, um, that there may be many more time, many many more springs in the landscape than that. Okay, so the focus of today's uh, discussion is about the biodiversity of springs-dependent species in this landscape. And so we, we seek to define springs-dependent species as those, again, uh, macroinvertebrates, plants, and vertebrates uh, with at least one life history stage dependent on springs or springs habitats. The question, underlying question here is, will this species exist without the springs habitat? If, it, if, if the answer to that is no, we call that a springs-dependent species. Um, we are in the process of developing species lists for all these different taxa. So far, our plant list is running to 2,100 plant species. Not all of these are going to be springs dependent in the, in the long run. Uh, some are only marginally occurring at springs, but there may be that many uh, species that we uh, will pay some attention to in the list. Fifth, uh, 1,150 invertebrate species so far. Again, this is a, it's a, it's a large list of, of largely unknown species, very poorly known to the uh, even to the scientific communities, some species new to science within the invertebrate realm. These are all being vetted through uh, expert taxonomists in these, uh, for these different groups so that we can get clarity on them. We note that some very large taxa, such as the flatworms, the physid snails, um, amphipods, and other groups that are commonly found at springs are, are um, the taxonomy is not very good. We don't actually know which, what species uh, we're dealing with there. There could be um, tens to even hundreds of species that are springs dependent that we don't have a very clear taxonomic resolution on yet, be and simply because there are no taxonomists that are uh, working on, on those groups. Much cryptic speciation exists at springs. So far, we've got uh, we're looking, our list of, uh, of vertebrates includes 50, uh, 54 species. There are about 200 species of fish in the in the desert southwest, and that list will probably the, the list of vertebrates will probably grow uh, as we as we go along. So again, the process here is to is to compile these lists, uh, have the experts look them over. Um, these are uh, uh, renowned uh, taxonomists working on these groups. We've so far engaged 10 different institutions, more than 15 taxonomists so far, and, uh, and that those lists of, of experts are still growing. The effort here is to, uh, is to provide this information to spring stewards so they understand the, the, the distribution of springs dependent species within their landscapes and the expen extent of springs dependence. This is a very large undertaking, not one that we'll uh, fully be able to complete with this project, but we hope to set the groundwork for it so that these are um, lists that can be added to over time, can be refined, and that, they, uh, that uh, land managers can use readily. Referencing the locations of this, these probably uh, several thousand springs dependent species is a, is a large task that will be ongoing. Uh, we won't be able to complete that probably in the time frame of this project, but we'll have a, at least um, a well-vetted list uh, and, uh, and annotated information and references on, on many of these species. This information is largely public already. These uh, species descriptions are published, you know, to, to describe a species, the species has to be described in a peer-reviewed scientific uh, uh, journal and those publications are open access, so this information already exists in a uh, largely in a, in, a, in, a, in a public context. There may be some occurrences of rare species at springs that, that remains the exclusive uh, uh, intellectual property of the land manager, um, but in general the kind of information that we're able to access is already public for these, for these taxa. Um, the effort here is to, uh, uh, is to uh, database these. Jerry will talk about that process after a little while to set the stage for accurate mapping. And um, 
And as I say, this is an ongoing process, and what, what our, our goal here really is to be able to apply the data we, we gather here to climate change risk modeling in task four, which is a, a subsequent process here. And again, if anybody has any questions, feel please feel free to uh, either uh, write them into the box there or just pipe up and, and, uh, and uh, we're happy to answer them if you're not muted. All right, where does this fall into our larger conceptual structure for, for understanding springs? The, the springs uh, dependent species are at the top of the, of the, of the uh, uh, factors that bring us springs. Springs are largely bottom up driven ecosystems with large scale climate hydrogeology, aquifer interactions, um, uh, forming and helping form the site and its geomorphology, uh, influencing the microclimate, those, in, in, uh, those factors in turn affect the disturbance regime and the productivity to create the template of microhabitats and soils that exist at springs. Those, those microhabitats, those springs complexes are, are colonized through biogeographic processes and when you arrive at a spring and look at the species inventory, the aquatic invertebrates, the vegetation, sea signs of vertebrates uh, occupying the spring. That's the, that's the assemblage composition that you, you uh, detect when you're there. There are trophic interactions going on among some of those species, and that whole uh, structure changes through time, as shown in this diagram. Some of those species and the, the uh, physical processes provide ecosystem goods and services, which can be exploited by humans, an exploitation that may affect the integrity of the microhabitats, the productivity of the site, and the interactions with the uh, disturbance regime and biogeography. So there's a uh, feedback from human uh, human stewardship of springs potentially into the uh, into the uh, structure of the ecosystem that you encounter when you visit there. This is a diagram that we put together quite a few years ago, but uh, but it pretty well captures what the uh, uh, where the springs dependent species show up in the in these unique ecosystems. Thank you. So the three groups of taxa that we're looking at are the spring's flora, macroinvertebrates, and the vertebrates. What we find within the spring's flora is that, is that there's a continuum of spring's dependence. Some species, such as the uh, such as the cardinal monkey flower on the right side of the screen there, very widespread. We find it in wetlands. We find it in typically uh, uh, along uh, slow moving de desert streams, but very widespread, not, not particularly springs dependent, uh, but it certainly does show up at many springs. In somewhat contrast to that, uh, obviously this is not an upland species, this is a wetland species. We get a lot of upland species in these landscapes as well. But Kind of in contrast to that widespread wetland uh, distribution pattern are species like the Helleborine orchid, which is, again, fairly widespread in the, south, in, in the western U.S. It's a rare species up in Montana, but it occurs only at springs. So uh, unlike the monkey flower, which can be more, it's more widespread in its distribution, Helleborine orchids are only found at springs. And then, of course, we have species such as McDougal sylvaria, uh, this uh, uh, large shrub that occurs just at a few springs in the lower end of Grand Canyon. So comes into the desert landscape, uh, uh, desert uh, LCC landscape, but um, just occurs uh, at, a, at a few springs. So it's kind of a wide array of springs dependence within the array of, of, uh, of plants you encounter at springs. Why is this important? Well, uh, we've been doing work on springs now around the western U.S. and within the, uh, within the landscapes that we've worked on, we typically find 20 to 25 percent of the flora in a very small number of springs within the landscape. In, uh, in Nevada, we looked at 76 springs in the Spring Mountains. We had uh, nearly 20 percent of the flora show up in 0.001 percent of the land area of the Spring Mountains at, at, at these springs that we looked at there. Um, Similarly, in Alberta, 56 springs produce 25% of the uh, flora. So the, the conservation importance of springs is enormous. The, the, the species packing of plants in the landscape is, is tremendous. There's no other ecosystem you could go into and find this level of species packing. Therefore, we, we, we really think of springs as, as hot spots in the, in the landscape. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to either 
uh, type them into the into the uh, chat box there, or or just go ahead and ask. In regard to the uh, taxonomists that we're we're um, inquiring about springs in this uh, in this effort, so far we've looked at uh, we've interacted with uh, several several folks uh, who are regional experts within Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, and Southern California. We will be uh, talking with other folks in Texas here over the next couple of months, and uh, and if you have any suggestions about experts in your area within the desert uh, LCC landscape, we'd be happy to interact with them too. Um, botanists are <coughs> sorry not known for their outgoing social personalities oftentimes, so um, it sometimes takes a little work to find the right people to talk to about these issues. Uh, we've had really useful discussions with these folks, especially with Glenn Rink, about scoring criteria that I'll present in a little bit, and uh, and many uh, important insights about springs-dependent plant species. All right, in the realm of uh, of zoology, we have uh, an invertebrates in particular. We're looking at two big groups of of macroinvertebrates: the, the non-insect springs-dependent species and those that are springs-dependent. The non-insect taxa are the ones that often don't have very good taxonomy. So uh, turbillaria, the flatworms down the lower right corner there, um, uh, leeches, nematodes especially, uh, amphipods, isopods, and and up in the upper left-hand corner, the amphipods are 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 um, uh, often rather poorly known. Within this realm, we have Pergolopsis. I think we're up to 130 species of, of just in the genus Pergolopsis, the spring snails. These are uh, tiny snails that occur often just at the just at the source of springs. Can't handle the the uh, spring runout channel environment. Many of them. And so, just a huge diversity. We're working with Robert Herschler out of the Smithsonian Institution, and um, actually we're just uh, with him in the process of describing a, a new species of Pergolopsis from the DLCC. So that'll that'll be uh, something that shows up here eventually. Aquatic mites are quite abundant. They're also very poorly known. Uh, mollusks, aquatic mollusks such as pea clams, also widespread and, and poorly known. Uh, so the non-insect Springs-dependent species in the landscape are quite abundant, and um, we're seeking taxonomists for many of these groups, and uh, and it's uh, it's kind of a long haul there. There are hundreds, there may well be thousands of species within the non-insect uh, groups that we we end up uh, considering as springs-dependent taxa here. All right, uh, one uh, Gary Alper is asking: Is there a pollinator specific to the orchid? Really good question. Um, uh, there are many pollinators uh, in the landscape that are that are worth um, uh, paying attention to. Uh, we don't know of a specific bee that uh, that pollinates this, but it wouldn't surprise us at all if there was a some specialization there. That specialization can actually vary across the landscape. So, what is a specialist pollinator here in the in the southwest might not be the same pollinator up in Montana or, or Idaho. Okay. Yep. All right. So, uh, in terms of the uh, the insects that are springs dependent taxa, this gets really kind of, uh, amazing because we have both uh, fully aquatic taxa and uh, and taxa that are what we might consider to be riparian, but only occur around springs. So, the elmid beetles, the riffle, uh, the long-tailed riffle beetles, many many species. We just uh, got notification that one of the springs in the DLCC Del Rio Springs in Central Arizona has a unique elmid beetle in it. Last we found, we could only find one individual at our last visit. That that's a spring that's being dewatered. So there are many species of elmids and other dryopoid beetles that that are uh, that are spring specialists. Um, uh, takes a lot of work to get to, to get clarity on what's what there. Most of the most of the morphological taxonomists say, well. We need genetics on this, so getting the genetics worked on those is, is kind of a longer-term challenge. Um, Nacorid water bugs in the upper right corner, many uh, species that are that are uh, living either in springs or in the springs outflow channels, uh, unique to that. The uh, dragonfly pictured in the middle at the top though, is there is called the masked club skimmer, Brechmorhoga pertinax, a species we discovered in Grand Canyon 
about 10 years ago, and uh, it lives only at spring-fed streams uh, in, uh, uh, that are warm water in central Grand Canyon, nowhere else in the U.S. And it may actually be a, either a unique, uh, unique subspecies or a unique species. We're working on the genetics on that now. Mayflies, the, among the most primitive in, uh, winged insects, are um, uh, we've got uh, several taxa in the southwest that we know of that are that are springs dependent. Um, uh, we've just been working on Morbatus uh, membrosaurus in, in Oak Creek. Uh, occurs at only one location in a spring-fed portion of Oak Creek. There, uh, same is true of, of stoneflies. Stoneflies are even more numerous. They're about a uh, I think our list, starting list, there was 120 species in the southwest, of, a, of which about uh, at least 20 percent are spring specialist. Boris Kondretiev at, the, uh, at uh, uh, Fort Collins at uh, CSU has been helping us with those groups, and also um, uh, Dick Bauman up at BYU. There are caddisflies, lower, right, lower left corner there, and, uh, and we'll talk more about the uh, water scorpions, some of which are springs dependent in the southwest. But in the middle of the slide are tiger beetles and ground beetles. These are, are critters that are actually terrestrial and also the delicopoded flies up in the upper left hand corner uh, there. Uh, these are critters that are riparian really in their in their habitat use but occur only at spring. So we've got uh, within the uh, um, uh, Tiger beetle world. We have a couple a uh, couple species that are unique to the springs within the uh, Grand Canyon region. Tiger beetles and ground beetles both that occur just along spring-fed streams. All right, next slide. Again, any questions? Please feel free to ask. In the vertebrate world, fish, amphibians, uh, uh, reptiles, and some mammals and some birds, even even a bird or two, are um, are, uh, are can be spring specialists. Usually we don't think of endangered fish like, like the humpback chub as being a spring specialist, and yet it only breeds successfully in the spring-fed outflow of the Little Colorado River. Therefore, it has a fair amount of springs dependence in its life history. If we lost the flow of, the, of, the, of blue springs in the Little Colorado River, we would likely uh, uh, lose the, the uh, humpback chub. Better known are the, is the radiation of cyprinodontidae, the, the pupfish throughout the southwest. Many, many uh, species there that are, are springs dependent in Death Valley, uh, uh, from Death Valley all the way down into Mexico. Um, the amphibians that live in springs, uh, springs such as cienegas and uh, wet meadows, and especially include leopard frogs and uh, other amphibians. Uh, those are, those are uh, prominent in the uh, conservation uh, realm and, in, and, and uh, kind of highlighted by management these days. Not not endangered, but uh, definitely habitats to be to be managed well. Um, oddly, uh, when you think about uh, other vertebrates and springs, you wouldn't necessarily think about dippers, but at low elevations, dippers nest almost exclusively in spread spring-fed streams. So even we we wouldn't think about birds as being spring specialists, and yet species like dippers nest exclusively in spring-fed outflow outflow. Um, in the mammal world, we have uh, you know not aquatic, not too many aquatic species. We don't have records of of the of the water shrew. I don't think in the DLCC yet, although they do occur in the uh, in the Southern Rockies landscape. That's a that's a, uh, a shrew that uh, requires requires water, and they're really cute diurnal things that run around and bite you like crazy when they catch them. But they they are uh, they they live uh, they, they swim in the water and catch. Uh, uh, their prey underwater. Uh, creatures such as voles, uh, um, the Nevada uh, Amargosa vole is now, uh, hasn't been seen in the last 30 years or so, occurred exclusively in ash meadows and, um, and was, a, was a wet meadow specialist. Uh, two of our most recently listed uh, reptiles in, in Arizona, the uh, two, two species of garter snakes, are both living in springs dependent, uh, in spring fed streams. And as does the uh, uh, quite a few populations of the uh, Sonoran mud turtle. What's interesting about springs is they function as keystone ecosystems, and therefore they're really important to the surrounding landscape. And even for species that are strictly upland, uh, such as bighorn sheep, uh, they need to water every day, and their source of water often are springs in the landscape. So, uh, so as keystone ecosystems, springs are often supporting 
many of the birds and uh, and more mobile large mammals in the, in the landscape. These complexes of species that, that occur at springs can, can create incredibly complicated uh, uh, trophic interactions. And Montezuma Well in Arizona, central Arizona, is a unithermal fishless spring that is dominated by predators uh, which feed on the amphipod, uh, a unique amphipod. The amphipod is in the middle of the picture there. The diurnal predators on the left side are water scorpions and damselflies and giant water bugs, the world's smallest giant water bug. Uh, they all feed on the amphipod during the day, and up from the ooze at night swim a horde of four species of leeches, including one unique genus of leech that can hear, mechanically hear the amphipod swimming, so the amphipod has to race back to the shoreline at night to avoid being preyed upon by leeches. So a very complicated trophic uh, system, very productive. Um, eight species of, uh, are used, six to eight species are unique in Montezuma Well, and that's the highest concentration of unique species of any point in North America. So it's a really exciting place to, to work. Dean Blinn's done a tr huge uh, service to, to understanding the, the, the functions of that, of that ecosystem. So these springs ecosystems can be quite complex. There are also places where a lot of non-native species show up. Some of those, like the in Ash Meadows, the Melanoides snails, don't show any clear relationship to, uh, to the density of native invertebrates. But the addition of crayfish into those, into those systems uh, pretty much devastates the, the, the native fauna because crayfish will eat everything uh, in, the, in, the, in the stream, fish, snakes, invertebrates, everything. So uh, the more crayfish you have in the lower graph there, the fewer native invertebrates uh, you typically have in the landscape. Gary Scapatoni has done a very nice publication on that, on that subject. So springs are hot spots. They, 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 they are places that, uh, that uh, have a lot of interactions going on, some of which are uh, involving non-native species. It can be quite uh, uh, detrimental to the native fauna. This is the list of some of the folks that we're dealing with so far with the uh, faunal experts. As you see, it's a long list, very diverse interests there, and, and many institutions across the, across the, the country. All right, uh, so in an effort to make this information more usable to springs managers, what we've done is to try to um, develop s uh, scoring criteria for the different springs dependent species. And these involve uh, three, level, three, three uh, uh, categories of information. How endemic, how locally endemic is a taxon? And the scoring here is like our, CEEP, uh, our, our springs inventory assessment uh, process, ranges from from zero to six, uh, and with nine, uh, a score of nine being not uh, unknowable or, or not applicable. But a score of zero for endemism means that the, the species is very wide ranging. Many birds fall into this category. Uh, a score of six means that it's a species that occurs only at a single spring. In terms of microhabitat use of the spring, uh, is the, is the critter kind of an upland species not, not really occurring at the spring, or does it range all the way up to something that's completely obligatory on the very source of the spring, not just the spring uh, habitat uh, downstream or the, the uh, runout channel, but actually the source. So some of the, some of the Pergolopsis spring snails fall into that category, and some of the almond beetles as well. So the use of the habitat, uh, as well as the level of endemism, and then whether the life history uh, is uh, tied in a, in, a, in a unique way to the spring. So this applies really to the fauna, not to the flora, uh, which have more or less uniform requirements for their life histories. But some organisms uh, might you know, not use the spring at any life stage or just have facultative occurrence at the springs. Those are low-scoring things. For example, bighorn sheep might come into water every once in a while. Um, we're not going to consider the list of all the species of the, of the animal species of the southwest in this, but, but in some important cases, maybe those things might get cited. Where, uh, whereas there are critters such as uh, 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 many, uh, some fish, some uh, uh, snails and whatnot, where the entire life cycle occurs in the spring's dominated habitats. So uh, we try to uh, let the managers know what the extent of life history requirement is related to springs for that species. In addition, we include several categories of cons the conservation status, both from the Endangered Species Act stat uh, standpoint, the nature serve uh, uh, global, national, and uh, regional uh, status levels, 
and, um, and as well as the IUCN uh, conservation status if those have been designated. So those are also included in this scoring process. Um, we can compare the, uh, what, what you might call the ecological uh, information about the species with the conservation status, and that, that uh, uh, might prove useful for management. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. We also want to include the types of springs uh, in which the species occurs, because that might be relevant to management. And then where we have information, try to provide through the annotation uh, uh, process information about the flow, water quality, and habitat requirements for those species. So giving three examples of how this is working out, for insects, we chose the uh, Montezuma water scorpion, Ranatra Montezuma, and um, uh, the level of endemism completely restricted to Montezuma well. Its microhabitat completely exclusive to the, to, the, to the spring. It lives its entire life in the spring. So it's very, uh, very much committed to the spring. The uh, conservation status of this thing is, is uh, regarded as being quite imperiled by, uh, so far by everybody but except the uh, Endangered Species Act. And, um, and even the state of Arizona recognizes it as a uh, high priority conservation species. We can compare those, the scoring there, uh, so the ecological score is, uh, is six, meaning completely restricted to the spring. The conservation score uh, rates is quite high there because four is imperiled uh, within the scoring system. And uh, other, other tax that we're looking at, we include in this, for this example, are species like the uh, Sonoran River Otter, Lantra canadensis sonora, the type of specimen was collected in Montezuma well. However, it was wide ranging throughout the Colorado River system, so its level of endemism is, is, uh, is uh, 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 above the level of the region. It's got uh, non-specific micro, uh, microhabitat uses. It uses springs and, and riparian uh, habitats and, and stream habitats. And it's got a life history uh, that is not uh, springs specific. However, this is a critter that may be extinct at this point, so its uh, conservation score is quite high. And uh, the last species we uh, talk about here is, is McDougal's Slaveria, a species that occurs at a few springs in Grand Canyon. Its level of endemism is uh, quite hot, quite specific to those few springs in Grand Canyon, not at a single spring, but at, at, a, at uh, a few springs. It is uh, uh, exclusively found at springs, and, um, and, uh, but the, because it's a plant, the life history scoring doesn't, doesn't apply to it conservation status is, is also pretty high, so therefore it has a, a high ecology score and a relatively high conservation score. Anybody have any questions, please feel free to ask, but we can compare the, uh, the springs dependence ecology score on the bottom axis there with the conservation status score. Again, the, uh, the Soren River Otter is not really very springs dependent, but it has a high conservation score, whereas the Montezuma Well Water Scorpion, completely dependent on springs, um, on one spring and has a relatively high conservation score. McDougall's Slavaria also uh, largely dependent on, on, uh, on, on but on multiple, uh, multiple springs and fairly high conservation score. So this is one way that those data might be useful in, uh, in, conserva in, in springs dependent species management within a landscape. And now we'll have Jerry Ledbetter talk a little bit about uh, how these data fit into the Spring Stewardship Database. Okay, this is Jerry Ledbetter, and I've been working with Benjamin Brandt, who is also on the, the line, if anyone has any questions uh, for me or for him. 
Uh, thanks for letting me know that you couldn't hear me. Uh, this is our um, our online database and um, that has uh, has been online for four or five. Uh, four or five months now. Uh, we have a lot of people who have signed up uh, to, to access the information. It's still in its uh, kind of initial phase and so uh, we're still kind of figuring out how to set permissions, but there's quite a long list of, of people who, who have set up a username and a password. If, uh, if you want to access this information, this database, it's at springsdata.org. Uh, anyone can create a username and a password, but you have to uh, contact us to, to get permissions to access any of the information. Uh, we have a taxonomic editor in here, and uh, I'll just go look at one of the species that, um, that Larry was talking about before. So um, this uh, Renatra Montezuma. And uh, all this information that, that he was describing is stored in here. We also have a, a cross-reference list of all, this, all the locations where that species has been reported. In this case, it's just Montezuma well, so it's a short list. Uh, but we have uh, the scientific name, the, you know, all the taxonomic information. Um, and then we also have the SDS and conservation status information that he was, he was showing you earlier. And uh, really easy drop-down boxes where you can access the information and, and uh, edit. And then we also have reference, a list of references down below. Um, and there's a, a references uh, form where you can add new references and, and link them to these various uh, taxa. Um, we can, in future development, we're planning to have a way that you can, um, that you can click on a map and show all the, the distribution data for the species. Again, this would just be one point, but for some of the species it would be many more. And we have an, a distribution tab where we can add a range map image. Um, we can have the elevation range and the localities where the information is uh, where these species are, are found. Uh, so we have a taxonomic editor for invertebrates, vertebrates, and flora, uh, and they're set up quite, quite similarly. Uh, I mentioned references. Uh, we have a, a reference management form, so you can uh, look up you know, all the references related to a particular species. Uh, and this is a, a reference, this is the reference title and the author and all the information about it. If there is a hyperlink, then it's located down here. So that's the general layout of this database. And um, like I said, it's still in development. It's still in, refi in it being refined. But um, over the next year, uh, we're going to be adding more and more functionality to this. Um, you can go into search for springs, for example, and look at um, just springs of Arizona, Coconino County, search and see all of the springs within the county. And you can go into maps and view it in Google Maps. So you can see as this database becomes increasingly used and increasingly populated, it, it can have just a wealth of information. Um, Gary is asking if we're going to add images. We do have the capacity to add images of, of species as well as images of range maps. Uh, we already have the ability to uh, upload images of springs. And there are several other places where, yes, we can, we can add imagery. OK. Any other questions? All right. Um, we wanted to uh, reiterate this issue of the, of the springs types and uh, their, their role in biodiversity. And um, 
what we're finding as we as we pursue different inventories in, in different landscapes is that uh, some spring types are really prone to having unique species in them. We mentioned Montezuma well. Montezuma well is a collapsed carbonate uh, limnoprene, pool forming spring, and um, and that's a that's a spring type that's uh, remarkably rich in unique species. Places where management detention um, is commonly focused. These are the the blue holes of the world. These are the 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 fountain of youth. If you're in Florida, Florida has 700 of these large pool forming springs. But also in our landscapes, uh, hanging gardens and gushets are places that have a great deal of uh, endemic biodiversity. Caves, cave springs as well. Uh, some hill slopes. Um, the only we don't have a guy. We don't have any geysers in the TLCC that are natural. But even those couple that we have that are uh, boreholes uh, in uh, Southern California um, are are hosting rare species. It's quite remarkable. They're they're pretty rem remarkable ecosystems. Places that tend tend to not support unique species are rhyocrines, springs that are emerging in uh, in channels. And the reason for that is because there's not enough evolutionary time there to establish genetic isolations. Floods roar through those systems, knocking out whatever uh, genes that might get fixed in the in the uh, in those populations. So these reoccurring springs are typically not places where you find unique species. Next slide here shows uh, some of the lentic spring types, including uh, the uh, um, linocrines, the carbonate mound forming springs. Uh, exposure springs are places like Devil's Hole. You know, uh, there's really only two uh, macro invertebrate macro species living in Devil's Hole: Devil's Hole pupfish and the uh, and the Elmid water beetle. There, both are uh, both of them are endemic to that one exposed uh, exposure of groundwater. There, helicrines have rare species, oftentimes. It's unusual to find unique species in, in marsh forming sienega or fen habitats, um, but there are some cases, a few, a few rare cases. Hypocrines are these uh, uh, springs in which the groundwater is expressed through the vegetation. And those typically are um, sufficiently ephemeral that, uh, that endemic springs forms don't show up there. Next slide. So um, task two uh, uh, for this process, the springs dependent species, is, is uh, underway. We're making, we think we're making pretty good headway with it. Where we're continuing to present uh, lists to to the uh, experts and getting getting refinement on those. Within about uh, by the end of the year, we'll have these uh, lists ready to post uh, for for your commentary. If you have species of of uh, concern to you that we might not have captured already, please feel free to. Uh, to uh, just email us, Larry at springstewardship.org, Jerry, J-E-R-I, Jerry at springstewardship.org, or Monica at springstewardship.org, and we'll uh, we'll include those uh, consideration of those species in and get the get the experts to uh, get back to us about those. We're continuing to identify springs and landscapes and regions where springs dependent species occur. These databases are very uh, interesting. CalBugs, for example, is a is a huge compendium of insect information for California. Uh, there are, uh, I think, the last count, there are about 4,000 springs cited in that in that database. Some of which hadn't been mapped before. Um, that's a, that's a great way to uh, tie in. If if you all know of other databases that we should be looking at. Uh, then uh, please let us know about those as well. The uh, database is being annotated. We're getting the literature in there. There may be critical papers that you think we should make sure we have in our in our reference uh, library for this process. Please feel free to share that if you're inclined. Um, and uh, we are headed towards being able eventually to map these data so that so that uh, you as a spring steward can uh, can hit a button to see. Uh, map of the distribution of all the springs, uh, springs dependent species in your landscape. However, that's not something we're going to be able to do, uh, have done within a uh, two-year time frame. So, uh, so what we're continuing to work on that, as Jerry has mentioned here. So, we're continuing to update and annotate this information. Uh, um, things change all the time. Species go extinct. New species are discovered. We're trying to pull that information in. And so, any any contributions that you might care to share with us about this. I think it does everyone good if we have common language to talk about springs and springs-dependent species, and uh, it's a way for 
partners in the landscapes to uh, to better uh, be better stewards. I think of their of their of their springs. All right, so that's uh, that's what we had to, to talk to today about the springs dependent species uh, components. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about the workshop that's planned for the 15th and 16th of October in 2014. This is um, a, uh, uh, a, a workshop in which we'll talk about our inventory and assessment protocols, which is part of the standard workshop we give, as well as uh, how to how to um, uh, uh, use and get get into and use the uh, Springs uh, stewardship uh, uh, geo database and and the online database. And um, uh, Jerry Ledbetter will be leading that portion of the workshop. I'll be leading the inventory and assessment. It'll be eight to five each uh, each of these two days. We're going to hold the uh, uh, hold the workshop at the U.S. Forest Service office in Las Vegas, and we'll send you that information. Please let other people know if, uh, about it. We've got uh, um, not too many people signed up for it yet, but uh, uh, good capacity there. And uh, and these are pretty great opportunities not only to learn about springs, but also to um, to begin to talk with. Uh, with others who are facing similar problems and uh, and find out some, what some of the common resources are and opportunities are. So um, we'll do field trips both days to um, to out to uh, local springs, some of which are in good shape, some of which are in bad shape, perhaps some which have been restored to try to uh, to uh, pull together uh, uh, to, to, to sharpen our perceptions about what to look for at springs when doing inventory and assessment, what some of the topics are, how spring types vary in terms of what their what their management challenges are. The cost is pretty nominal for this and uh, let us know if you have trouble meeting that cost because we want participation more uh, than we want um, uh, your money, of course, and so uh, uh, please contact Monica at, at Monica at springstewardship.org to uh, to sign up for the workshop, and uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. It, uh, uh, these are these are great great opportunities to uh, get bring more attention to these to these essential ecosystems and to be able to share language. All right. Does anyone have any questions about the the workshop or or anything else we've talked about today? And or and if you uh, don't want to share now or or think of something um, in the uh, uh, near future, please feel free to email us or or call us. And any suggestions or problems you might be having with this these presentations, these webinars are quarterly, so we'll have another one uh, late in the year. And uh, and we look forward to having uh, uh, additional batch of these next year. So at the same rate, that'll keep you. Uh, informed about where we are with progress. The intent here is really to provide uh, a framework for anybody who's interested in springs to be able to to be able to uh, uh, compile their information, safely store it, and if they choose to be able to talk with their neighbors or others about about uh, issues and uh, and challenges. With the Sky Islands Alliance in Tucson, uh, which we've been collaborating very closely with, we're in the process of develop, developing a uh, Springs Restoration Handbook for Arizona, and uh, to build on a similar um, uh, startup process that we had in, in Nevada, and that will provide information to uh, to spring stewards about how to restore springs if if they if people choose to. Our next webinar will be late, later in the year, uh, and there we'll, we'll begin to focus on the relationship between uh, task two and task four and how to integrate that climate change risk modeling. Uh, if you have any suggestions for uh, webinar topics, that, uh, things you want to hear about, please, again, please email us or, or let us know. And uh, any other questions show up on our, uh, on our list here. And uh, if anybody cares to share anything now, we're 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 open to uh, to any kind of comment. We have any any comments from the native participants? fish as they say too. So I'm wondering if there's some more straightforward about fish sampling that could be done or something for warm soil garters. You know, it's not too complicated. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Any anybody have any comments for us or, or any questions or anything? You're in, you're not muted, so. It would be quite 
because some of those areas literally are totally closed in. But again, I'm going to have the opportunity to do some coming forward after. Touching. Okay. Brian, are you trying to ask a yeah. question? Yeah, we don't have a whole lot. Brian, are you asking us a question? I'll just try to get him to think along the lines that we were when we sat with Marty and all of you. Right. Very good. Well, hearing the questions, but uh, again, yeah, please yeah. feel free to contact us. And get some steam here. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Jim. Jim. And we look forward to uh, to hearing from you more. And stay tuned for both the workshop in October and uh, the, the webinar later in the year. We'll let you know well in advance as to when that will take place. So thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate uh, you sitting in on the on the webinar and and for your stewardship of Springs. We know some of you are are already deeply committed to the to the task, and the the uh, we feel the benefits to not only to uh, individual land stewardship. Uh, for us here, but also to the, to the well-being of, of the of the Southwest in general is is, uh, is critical. And Springs are a great place to to uh, bring uh, a lot of attention and education to the to uh, focus. So thank you very much for your time today, and have a good day.